with all the big calls on all those big races. Welcome back. It is a classic double header here on What A Shout, Racing Post flagship weekend feature show with our sponsors, Bet365. Oh, it's a diamond jubilee as well. Myself, Dave Orton, thrilled to be back here, beavering away <coughs> with some top talent <coughs> while you put your feet up in the garden. Street parties everywhere. Get your bunting out. Who wins the derby? That will be the final of our five big race previews coming your way. If you want to get involved, interact with us, get your questions or your naps in below. Is Desert Crown a good thing? Is he LA? You can do that by liking and subscribing if you're watching on Facebook. Welcome along to the party. Get involved on Twitter. Hashtag what a shout. Let's go straight down the panel without further ado. Robbie Wilde as the anti-postman is back. Tell you what, I quite like that intro there. That was, that was all yeah, right. One of it? your better ones. Listen, I am getting I'm getting excited about this weekend. We oh, are good here. to see you're excited last weekend as well. Was I? Yeah. Uh, coming it, out your shell a bit. Excited <laughs> with something which we're which we're desperately trying to knock on your shell. It's a hard exterior, isn't it? But uh, it can be, mate, yeah. Yeah, very much. So yeah, looking forward to it. Weekend off. You've, been, you've put one up for Derby from a long way out. Don't tell us it now, because we're going to preview it in Toilet. its entirety. But, uh, yep. Lockdown vibes in London. We're in the capital, of course. And this reminded me of 2020, because it's, it's, I mean, loads of road closures, stuff like that. Very quiet on the way, and the sun is blazing. Everyone up for this weekend. Yeah, it'll be booting off later, won't it? It will be. Epsom sold out. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Ever been? Uh, no, I haven't, no. To the Derby meeting? No. I mean, I've, I've, only, I've only actually been to about 12 race courses, which isn't that much for someone in my job, I suppose, but you've been? Bit of a keyboard warrior. I have been. A keyboard I have, warrior. Yeah. I have been. Let's go to one man that's definitely been, and will he be there on the doubleheader this week? Go on to Pat Cooney in Stoke. Uh, no, I'm in the office, uh, both uh, Oaks Day and Derby Day, but uh, for my sins, I've been allowed out to Perth Races, where we sponsor on Sunday, so it's a seven-hour journey up there, but I'm, I'm up for it. Mad keen. Honestly, there are regular viewers I've got, and like, Pat Cooney is obsessed with Perth, they say to me when I'm on the track. We ring a bell, so looking forward to that, but let's just come to you quickly before I go to our big guest this week. The Derby, the turnover, the Diamond Jubilee, it's going to be off the charts, right? Oh, absolutely. In terms of uh, highest turnover races, of course, the Grand National stands alone. But a clear second and daylight to between him and the, and the rest of them is the Epsom Derby. And, uh, you know, I come from an era uh, when, uh, you know, Lester Piggott was uh, was the uh, the main man. And everyone used to walk around saying, what's Lester riding? What's Lester riding? So it had the man in the streets. Uh, you know, he was always very interested on it. And as you touched on there, it's a sellout crowd on Saturday. So maybe there is life in this sport yet. Yeah, 4.30 on Saturday, of course, the Kazoo Derby. For the first time ever, run in the memory of the great Lester Piggott. Very sad for racing this week. Lester was admitted to hospital a couple of weeks ago in his second home of Switzerland. And uh, we have had his son-in-law, William Agus, of course, on the show. Uh, to all the family, everyone from the Racing Post, really feeling that. Hopefully we did you proud. It, it, it kind of makes you proud to be part of the racing post at times did you get on monday yeah that was decent a package coverage. decent package yeah um lee mott said was off i mean just a, a top operator of his own, wasn't he? yeah i mean i've obviously not met lester he wasn't around in my time but he's obviously left a massive imprint on the sport he's got a statue anyone with a statue has done something pretty special <laughs> <haven't> they, <so. laughs> well absolutely quite right and it is interesting actually robbie I, I, I said to you just before we came on it would be an interesting angle for you because lester was before my time of course i remember you know, he's come back at the Breeders' Cup. I also remember, and we'll go to Pat about this in a second, when he came back from five years away for his ride, his comeback, it was Leicester at Leicester. That was his first ride back. And if you, the footage is out there, you can find it on YouTube, etc. He walks through this almost like guard of honour for a mile from the way in, cameras and the media everywhere. What do, I mean, is it just someone that you've always known riders compare themselves to? Yeah, the exactly that. And um, even like people who don't follow a race in my family would just know who he is. So that kind of tells you what he achieved. It's the beauty I mean, of racing, isn't it? You inherit these legends as we go down with a yeah, exactly. equine or jockey. Exactly. Giants. I mean, I'm sure Frankie will be kind of that sort of level when he retires as well. Yeah. They're the, kind of the big two, aren't they? Yeah, all the time. absolutely. On the Very flat, much so. Pat, you did see Leicester in the flesh, of course. Sad day. Yeah, absolutely. And do you know, the first, one of the first times I ever went horse racing, my mum took me to Ascot when the minstrel won the King George. That was back in 1977. And uh, she said to me, there he is, go over, get him, and he'll give you an autograph, sign your race card. I think, well, I don't, I don't suppose he will. But he did do. Do you know, I can't find that race card ever since. I've been looking for it up in the loft, all sorts for it. And, uh, but, yeah, so I, I, I've been a you know, huge fan of him ever since and uh, a lovely man. I actually met him a couple of times at Newmarket and uh, always got on quite well with him as well. So uh, it, was, it was a big deal for me. Yeah, absolutely. If you're watching the coverage this weekend, if you're lucky enough to be going to Epsom, you're going to feel the vibes of the Queen and Leicester reverberating around. 
We move on then. OK, what have we got on the show for you coming up? Willie Muir joins us, the Lambourne Supremo pile driver in the Coronation Cup, and he's got one fancied on the card as well. We'll also be giving you five big race previews, and those all important. We're going to do better this weekend for you. Weekend naps. Well, it's a very warm welcome. Let's go to Wantage to Lambourne, train up, making his debut here on What a Shout. It's a big weekend for William Muir. Let's beam him in. There he is. Good morning. How are you all? Absolutely fantastic. I guess you must be very excited about this weekend, William, but let's get to that. You've been in racing more than most. I mean, I got into racing about the turn of the millennium, William, but I used to know this sprinter called Averti back from the day, who very nearly won you your Group 1. You, you, you've had some rippers over the years. I, you know, being a 20-something lad getting into racing here at the Post then, really had you down as horses for speed. Stepper Point was one of my favourites as well. Yeah, we've had some, over the years, we've had some terrific horses. Uh, uh, when I first started, everybody said, oh, yeah, he's a sprint, you know, he's a sprint trainer. But then we got the likes of Enforcer, who was a wonderful horse. He got rated 120. So Pile Driver's only got one pound above it, you know, and he went through everything, Group 2s. He didn't win a Group 1, but he ran in the Coronation, and he gave five pounds to Ouija Board, and she was a neck in front. We were third, she was second, and Scirocco won it. And it was one heck of a run for a horse that cost 13 grand and then we bought um for a long for eleven and a half thousand. she was absolutely fantastic she was sort of one of the changes that life has in, in this game yeah she was wonderful enforcer texas gold all the names out there for our more mature viewers the one thing that i was always told about you william when i got into racing my old boss a grand dench big fan of yours denchy he used to say, you're one of the shrewdest people around. You know what you've got at home. And it's fair to say that when one of yours attracts a little bit of money, they're not too far off. Now, you've got two runners at Epsom tomorrow. But let's just talk about the natural progression. Obviously, we had the pandemic, William. How difficult was it to cope with that? You've now got Chris Grassick, of course, in one of these more modern joint training licences as well. Just remind our viewers, for those that aren't aware, exactly how that came about. Well, Chris used to be with Archie Watson and they were... They were doing Chris wanted to start training, but in this day and age, if Chris had started on his own, finance is a major thing. And so, unless you're a very wealthy person in this game, and he was going to start with maybe a handful of horses, six, seven. And we used to chat on the gallops every day because he, he used to be up there all lots, so I would see him up there. And he said to me, You know, would you ever fancy you know, having a joint license? And I said, Look, I've been in the game long enough, you won't change my ways because my ways are my ways, but you want to come and you bring your owners, why should we? It'll give you a help. It'll give you a help. And, and that's what life's got to be all about. Help somebody else in life. Don't just go through life thinking it's all about one. So help somebody else. So he joined us. Great worker. Great lad. Nice personality. So everything's good. We, we go well together. Um, I obviously, my owners have been my mates for all my training career, my, my same owners have stuck with me through, through thick and thin, so they deal with me, of course they do, because that's what they're like. Chris has got his own owners, and it's, it works really well, but we work together as a, you know, as a team training, and it, like I said to him, because if you come to me, you are going to have to work, because I work from first thing in the morning to last thing at night, so if you don't keep up with me, it won't work. And he has done, he's kept on, and to be fair, he's a grafter, and I like the lad. And one day he might just say, maybe the end of the year, maybe a year after it, I want to try it on my own now, which is perfect. We've got it set up that he can do that whenever he wants. But I feel that I've given somebody a helping life. And all it took was for Chris to come along and you got the group one, <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah, no, it took me all my, I started in 1990, <laughs> and it took me all that time to get my head into the group one. And then Chris was in the first year, but he was lucky the year he started. Because Power Driver was already here, and I know exactly the way we do things with him. So, yeah, we just it just happened exactly the same, <clears throat> no different. And it's great for him because no matter what happens through his life, he's he's on the he's on the thing. He's trying to group one winner. We've got two runners tomorrow. Then let's look hone in on this this great Oaks card. Then because you know, obviously at four thirty, we've got the Phillies' time to shine. But the other group one on the card, he's becoming hopefully the first back-to-back -back winner of the race in St Nicholas Abbey. Of course, it is pile driver in the Coronation Cup. That was your group one for any of our younger viewers out there or if you're new to racing, you're not exactly sure, go back in your members club, have a look at that replay because, William, it, that 
really epitomised everything we know about Oz. He's known as Rocky Balboa of racing, isn't he? Our front-running Chris Cook, who did a piece with your owners, of course, this week in the weekly email, called him a magnificent animal. He is the underdog, isn't he, of course, wherever he goes, but he's proved himself to be a globetrotting proper great one horse. Everyone loves him. How is he? Oh, he's, he's in great shape. Um, he's done everything we've asked. When we come back from Dubai, we give him not a holiday. We didn't turn him out. He just tipped away, he just went round the village, showed off, done a little hat country there and everywhere for at least five weeks. And then in the second five weeks, we've just picked him back up and put the finishing touches on him. Touch wood, everything's done. He's had his exercise today. Everything's gone to plan. We couldn't ask for any more. He had a way day to Newbury, which was... Very exciting for me because as we've done that every time and this was as, just the same, no different. You know, somebody come down and I said, look, I went away buzzing because it was sensational. And it was, but it wasn't because he broke the land speed record. He went down there exactly the same. His enthusiasm, everything was the same. Didn't have Martin to ride him, but the lad that rode him was so excited. And we were just delighted with him. Let's have a word about... Uh, Martin Dwyer, of course, because on one hand you've got William Muir, on the other hand you've got Martin Dwyer, haven't you, of course, and so pivotal to his success. Third in the St Ledger. Obviously, this race last year, Martin on the side. I was frank, he took the, uh, the ride in Dubai. I know you considered yourselves rather unlucky there. He was blimmin' unlucky not to go close in Hong Kong as well, wasn't he? Um, this looks like his race. The handicap has got you winning it. I guess you're not worried about the ground or the small field. It was exactly the same 12 months ago. The ground has never been an issue. I mean, you've, we've trained good horses before, like Texas Gold, and you're always go to bed if you hope it doesn't rain because if it goes loose or moves under his feet, he just can't run. You know, he can't do it. And uh, you know, we were going for a Stewart's Cup with him once, and it ground changed. We had to pull him out of the races, and then he won the week later. He was in the form of his life. So, but this horse never have you gone to bed and thought it doesn't matter what happens, just go to sleep and get up and go back to work. It doesn't matter whether the ground's quick. Or slow, he can he can handle both. Well, I just want to get a little bit political with you then, William, because when he won on his debut at Salisbury, you look down the form and you see something which is a rather bizarre going description for him these days, isn't it? And the word firm is there, of course, at Salisbury. What have you made in the last couple of weeks about all these courses having to abandon halfway through? Uh, well, I think it's very sad because it's sad for the owners more than anybody else. Owners pay good money to get their horses ready, go to the races, and then this this sort of thing happens. It's sad for the clerk of the course as well, because it's a very difficult job. I just, I don't know. I've been in the game a long time. We are using, we have got so much racing now. I'm probably the only person that's going to say this, but my dad was a farmer. I'm just wondering whether these trucks are now getting so much use, it doesn't get back down in and it doesn't bed in properly and you haven't got solid turf. So the, the turf moves and underneath it's quick and then that's it, they're down. So that, that, I just wonder if there's more to it than just slippy ground. I know people are saying the ground is lush and everything, but we do give these trucks a lot of work. Do you think that the people that run racing and make these decisions have, have got the cojones to reduce the fixture list, William, or are we just shooting into the No, I, think, I just think they just think more and more and more. And uh, to be honest, you, to me, I drive the box racing, so I see the lads. And the main travelling head lads I'm talking about, the people that drive the box... These boys are worked and worked and what you see them racing and everything. It's fine for me. It's my business. I can do and push. But these boys, you see them when they get towards the end of the summer. They're out on their feet. Yeah. Seven days a week, they go and do it. And something will give in the end because the boys, the good lads will say, we can't just keep this up till they'll move away from racing. I just think it's too much. Staffing problems in every sector at the moment, racing one of them as well. Absolutely the unsung heroes of the game. Let's bring it back to the Coronation Cup then, William. All being well, and he sails through this, what will be next? He's in the Hardwick, isn't he? Is that going to be a bit too soon? Are we going to revert to last year's supposed plan? King George, International, Ark. Well, you've got it. You've got it in one. No, we're not going international. I'm staying, I'm staying to a mile and a half. Um... We're going to go, our plan is, what was and still is, is Coronation, King George. Well, we want the Ark, so whether we get a prep race somewhere in between. Um, we're in the Hardwick because, as you know, things can happen at the 12th hour. And if he turned on a stone or he bruised a foot or something like that, we have got a backup down the road. But we've 
touching wood, everything has gone to plan. So that race doesn't look like it's going to be the answer to go there. So at this present time, that's not even been discussed. But you never know if things can change and, and we see where we go. But at the moment, it's Friday, um, King George, and then which race we pick before the arc. And then it's international. We are going to go, whether it be America for a Breeders' Cup or back to Hong Kong. We want to go to Hong Kong. That's uh, that's one of the places we want to go back because we've got unfinished business. This is a trip of a lifetime, of course, William, isn't it? Uh, uh, just to remind everyone, he has been a bit frustrating because he had that hold-up, of course. The owners weren't able to see him at Royal Ascot when he got his win as well. I'm assuming you're all flocking there in your masses. And unlike you and me who are dressed down on the Queen Jubilee Thursday, the top hat's got to come out, right? Oh, we'll be there every day. We've missed it. We we always go for the whole week and we've done it all of our career. And we have, you know, drinks for owners in the car park afterwards. And it's one of them things. And I, I said to them, I was there on my own with a with a brown with a brown bag of sandwiches and whatever from what they used to give us. And we sat at a table. We were all sat, sad trainers sat all over the place because we couldn't get near each other. And I said to them, if, if we'd have been normal, we'd have still been celebrating now. And you've got to run him in the final race tomorrow, William. Will you be, again, sorry about this, viewers, this is Chris Cook's fault. Will you be piling on to top secret in the last? He's a horse I absolutely love. Love him. I think he's wonderful. He can't, I was very fortunate to get him. He came to me and um, he's just thrived and thrived and thrived. Trained his brother. His brother, you know, Epsom, he has a run on a track like this for me. But it's so straightforward. I can't see why it can be a problem. But there's, if there's, if there's an, if if this was like Ascot, I'd be going there thinking, yeah, great. If I've got any thought, and I, I shouldn't really even be thinking about it because he can do anything and go anywhere. Um, so yeah, I think he's got. Yes, uh, we we're expecting him to maybe come on for that very near miss on his return at Newbury last time. I just want to ask you before we sign off, William, about what's called Red Vineyard. Of course, he sustained a problem, didn't he, after running in the London Gold Cup when turning in, it looked like Tom Marquand thought he was on Frankel. Yeah, Tom said he was giving him, you know, he was everything was going to plan. He moved. It's still, if you watch the replay, everything was off the bridle behind him. I don't know whether the front ones had gone a bit quick, and I, and whether. But Tom said, "I'm telling you, William, I still had loads <laughs> underneath me." And then all of a sudden, he took one bad step, and he thought there's something wrong, so he eased him down very quickly, pulled up a little bit sore. By the time we got back to the stables and washed him down, he was quite lame. Vets came and put a Robert Doan bandage on him. I got him back home. My vet was there, and we, he had a very, very small congenital fracture, which they put two screws in it the next day. No, he's like a cricket. You think it's, you know, you. I've never seen a horse have an op like this and come out of it so well. He, you know, he's rearing and bucking around his box. He's had three weeks. Today, I think it's three weeks. So he's onwards and upwards from here. And because of the family, and we know the family, because the, the owner, uh, Mr. Edgington, owned the mare and bred all these. He, we know the family just get better with age. So this may be a blessing because the vets have guaranteed me that this will not stop him filling his potential. So although he's had these two screws, he can still get to the very place he could have without it. Yeah, I wanted to mention him, William, because you just get the feeling he might have been the next one on the conveyor belt. So fingers crossed for him, just another advert of what can go wrong with a horse in its young career. Well, William, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. You can tell you love talking about the game and things are in a good place at the moment. We wish you well, you, the team, Chris, and all the owners tomorrow. We will be screaming him on and top secret as well. And hopefully we'll get you back on when we're looking to. at international targets later on, William. Love to come back on any time you want. Thank A you. Absolutely fantastic. What a pleasure that was. There we are then. That was an absolute pleasure that was. You get the feeling, Robbie, that some people just love talking about the game. Yeah, he's a good talker, isn't he, Muir? I mean, not all trainers are kind of that expressive, so that was a breath of fresh air. And he's taken on the joint training licence, of course. We had a bit of a laugh that William had been nutting in group ones along the way, mainly the sprints, but then Chris Grassett comes along and they get it with Pile Driver as well. <laughs> We're going to preview the great horse as well, but it's hard not to be a fan of Pile Driver. Oh, it? massively, yeah. I mean, his, his breeding is just really interesting as well. Like, he shouldn't really be able to stay this far as a son of Harbour Watch, but he just keeps. He keeps defying the odds, doesn't he? And he definitely sets a clear standard in the Coronation Cup. Yeah, and watch out for top secret, Pat, in the last, because you get the feeling if the top hats are flying up from connections, which they will be, if he pulls off the double in the Coronation Cup, they're going to smash top secret. Yeah, and put me down as a fan as well. He, he had a winner of a race we sponsored at Sandown, Red Vineyard, who uh, 
didn't finish lame next time he ran. But uh, yeah, he, he was very informative, very polite, and uh, clearly knows his stuff. So, uh, you know, big, big couple of days for him. I wish him well. Absolutely. Right. The moment you've all been waiting for. Friday, Saturday. Let's get into some big race previews. Well, you'll be really revved up on Friday then, waiting for the Oaks. But there is another group one. It's the Coronation Cup, won by some greats over the years. Another small field, Pat Cooney. But we've got the reigning champion coming back. Yeah, pile driver. And at first glance, I thought, oh, maybe we can oppose this fella. Um, but then you look at the official ratings. He's a pound in front of a couple and two pounds. And then I watched his unlucky defeat in, uh, in Maidan. And really, he should have won that day. And so he's clearly in good form. William, you're obviously very, very happy with him. And the one thing I keep coming back to Pildro, I think the race is going to set up well for him. There's only the six runners. You're going to have probably living legend going forward. High definition made the running last time he ran. And to me, if it's Frankie Dettori aboard Piledriver, he's just going to tuck in behind and he's on the best horse in the race. I don't know what Manobo is going to do. I mean, he was beaten on mirror over two miles last time he ran. Can he drop down to a mile and a half? I didn't know. Hookums always are possible. But the more I think about it, the more I think it just stacks up really well for pile drive. He's the best in the race, and I think the race is going to be run to suit him the most. Absolutely agree with all that. If you remember last year, Pat, there was plenty of juice in the ground. William quite mm. rightly says, very interesting during that interview, one on firm. Interesting thoughts about the tracks, guys, out there as well, wasn't it? But soft, no problems whatsoever. He was unlucky in Dubai. I think he's going to yeah, win this. I, thought, I, I, th I think Pat's right as well. I think Huckam might be the danger. You're looking at it from a different angle. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I was all tempted to put up pile driver. I mean, um, just to say as well, I think this is actually a pretty pretty good race. I mean, it's only six runners, but I think it's just as good as many we've had in recent years. Yeah, often um, race that uh, cuts up, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, as you say, I'm lucky in the, uh, the Shima Classic. I just thought on a line through your beer, who was probably the... Actually, I thought he was kind of unlucky as well in that Shima Classic. He was yeah. finishing fast. I mean, living legend trip, did he at beat all? him yeah. quite comfortably, actually, in the Jockey Club This would be a surprise, wouldn't it, time. if living legend did it? It would. I just thought he was too big at about 10 to 1. He caused um, a shot that day, of course. Your beer was one of the shortest price. Yeah, he went one, one, one to four, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe you could argue your beer's just not run his race, but I just thought he deserved to be shorter than that. That was the first time he'd run over one mile four for a while. He's on the upgrade. Um, I'm not sure about Manobo uh, and Hookham. Mm. I think they're probably better every bit further. And the rain is kind of... It, I think it's going to be a good ground on Friday, whereas on Saturday, it, there could be a bit of soft in it. You'd imagine so, there might be a bit of pace on, mightn't you? You're talking about yeah, horses you got, like, like Living Legend, for example, but Manobo definitely wants a bit further. I think we yeah, can say that. Yeah, bed. Palavicino makes the running quite yes. a lot as well. It's and high definition nearly pulled it off. So I suppose, yeah, I mean... That, well, it was going to suit a stayer, but I just thought Living Legend uh, was, was a bit big. Yep. All right, OK. Let's move on to the Oaks then. Uh, the second Phillies Classic of the domestic season here. Uh, Pat, all about Emily Upjohn in the anti-post market. Since the draws come out and the final field is set, have we seen any movers? Uh, well, not really. I, I think what, what we're looking at now is, that it's, it's, I would say with 11, it's maybe a bigger field than we, we had originally thought. So I think if you're on the Emily Upjohn at the sexy price, as well done for you. She was 10 to 1 after she won at Sandown on her reappearance. So uh, she's just shortened and shortened. I don't think she should deserve to be anywhere near 11 or 10 against. This is a talent-packed field. The one we keep laying, of course, is Nashua, her stable mate with Holly Doyle aboard. And you know, Holly Doyle has a tremendous following and, uh, you know, that would really be the front page story were she to win. Is she good enough? Well, she's only three pounds behind Emily on official rating, so she can do. And it's just very much an interest in each way angle in the race. You've got plenty of horses at big prices that are more than capable of even winning and certainly getting in the frame. Um, I actually keep coming back to one that seems to have been forgotten about, really, which is with the moonlight of Charlie Appleby and Will Buick. Not much wrong picking those two to throw your saddle over. But when she won at Newmarket um, at the Guineas meeting, she clocked a really, really fast time. And at the time, I thought, well, maybe that's the Oaks winner. Stamina maybe to be taken on trust. But no one seems to be talking about her at the moment. But I keep watching that run at Newmarket and thinking, yeah, I could see her running a big race. As for the Aidan O'Brien horses, I just can't make my mind up between the, you know, the, the main ones in that race. So if I don't fancy one of them, I can't put them all up. So I'm looking at With the Moonlight as maybe a degree of value in this race. Mm, OK, yeah, I think a lot of people are doing that at, at the moment, Pat. When you hear John Gosden uh, during Breakfast to the Stars when she had her little checkout of the track that morning, compare her with, uh, to Gruda, John's other winner of the race, you start to think, oh, here we go, this is just... 
all over, but she's skinny, right? Yeah, very much so. Um, she's not, you, can you, we really say she's beaten a, a really good horse yet, either? And she's come from nowhere. Yep, she has. Um, I'd rather look at kind of bona fide group one form. Such um, as? I like Concert Hall here. Um, it does seem I mean, the solid one of O'Brien's. Yeah, I mean, O'Brien has, I think he's won like 25 of the last 50 classics um, up until this season. And Concert Hall kind of has a similar profile to a lot of his recent Oaks winners in that she's really experienced. Like, yeah. Concert Hall, she's run, run eight times. That's three more than any other horse in the field. But I mean, Snowfall, yeah, Love, yeah. Um, Qualify, Minding, they're all really experienced going into the race. And I just think she's complete. She's much better this season, and that's the same as those fillies. Um, she was quite. She was an impressive winner of the trial at Navan, the uh, the Southville Stakes on her return. Then she dropped to a mile. Uh, didn't that looked to be on the short side behind Homeless Songs? But she only got a neck to farm with Tuesday. Just um, on pedigree, I thought Tuesday was kind of. I know she's a sister to Minding, but yeah. Minding won the Oaks, but Minding was more of a mile, a mile two. I wonder if she's had a couple of hard races, and of course Ryan Moore has to ride her, I think, because she's got the best form in yeah. the race of the O'Brien. But still won when that Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another graveyard. Ade obviously uh, proved that wrong. Um, but I just yeah. I just think the, the way Concert all finished that race, she finished it more like a, she would be better suited to this one mile four trip, the Guineas race. Yeah, okay. So I think 10 to 1 is a very good price. Yeah, I, again, per perfectly prepared to see Emily Upjohn do something smashing. And if, and, and if so, fingers on the butters for, for the King George and the arc, that three-year-old Phillies allowance will be coming into it. Anti-post, we're really starting to see the chess pieces fall in. It's thoughts of June for me. Spoke to Aidan, as you know, regular viewers, a couple of weeks back. And I just got the feeling with him that this was the mature in the pack. She reminds me more of Snowfall peeping for these Aidan O'Brien Phillies that keep going. I'm a bit surprised that there's not more love for her. And Wade Lawn takes the ride, happy with the draw. She's a pace angle probably in the race. She keeps finding. I loved her run at Chester. Don't forget, an able one at Chester for coming here. And we've seen Above the Curve come out in the pre-St. Alley yeah. last week and win. I think Above the Curve did shape a little better than her at Chester. But, I mean, she had she's... a wider trip, didn't she? Yeah. I just thought that too, pe th that too many people made more of the market there. She was smashed Above the Curve. And yeah. people thought, well, it's the wide trip that's beaten her. Watch the finish back in your members' club. I think she keeps going. And Aidan said something key to me. Every month that Thoughts of June gets on her back is going to be in her favour. They're the sort of things you take out of what Aidan says to you. And I'm, I'll happily give her a go. I'm quite Yeah, I, I, get, I get that completely. I mean, she, she, she is a bit too big at uh, a price. She might just be vulnerable to something with a bigger turn of foot, but if it's a test, <coughs> yeah, some, this one goes well. That's the Friday done. Shall we move to the Saturday? We've got the Diamed coming up for you, one of three races, plus the Dash. Are we going to have a couple of darts as that? Who fancies something strongly in that? And then, of course, the Derby, the draw finally out then. All right, let's go to the Diamed, uh, Pat. Um, the first of three races that we're covering on Saturday. A lot will be said about modern news in this race. We're not so sure, though. No, modern news is priced up really on what he's going to be, I feel, rather than what he is right now. Of course, he was a, the big mover in the Lincoln handicap. That didn't work out. And he's won OK in two subsequent races. And yes, he probably will be a Group 3 winner and beyond by the end of the season. But you're asking to back him at a short enough price, given the quality of the opposition. He's very much in the, yeah, he can win, but he's no value at his current price. I'm really surprised Mutter Sabik of Charlie Hills and Jim Crowley isn't a lot, whole lot shorter in this market. I mean, this is a Group 3. He ran at Sandown in a race we sponsored. Um, back in April, and he was undeniably a very unlucky loser. He was all dressed up, nowhere to go at all. You can mark him down as the moral winner of that. So he's the moral winner of a Group 2 running in a Group 3. I think they'll be a lot closer in the market. I think Muta Sabik is the one to beat, granted a clear run. The rest of them, I think, have a little bit to prove. So I'm just looking upon it as either or Muta Sabik or Mod News. And at prices, you can only back Muta Basik. Here. Here, I think we're going to oh. the panel, aren't we? <laughs> Echo what Pat Cooney just said there. Yeah. I mean, what well, just look just looking at these two horses, I'd have thought they'd be kind of like the same price. He beat Bell Rock, didn't he, at Windsor Modern News yeah. very easily, but I don't necessarily think that's his track, Bell te Rock and Tempus. That's like, the horse, isn't it? That put we gave him a race post rate of one one six, which means on paper the bookies are looking at this thinking. You know, all the traders will that he has to start favourite here. Yeah. But Mutasarbet was desperately unlucky, wasn't he, at Sandown? Oh, massively, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, he's, he's just got no run through and he's only been beaten the neck by Lights On, who's a, a typical Sir Michael Stout four year old improver. Yeah. Um, that, that form's already worked out 
well, to a certain extent, with no near never. Um, Alcohol free, sorry, coming out and uh, running and some Ray Major to a certain extent, and in the John and Gaunt, yeah. yeah. Um, I just think, it, I mean, he Sobek was established as a better three-year-old than modern news as well, yeah. And I just don't think he's had the chance to come out and, and prove how good he is. And the fact that the weather forecast is uncertain, the fact that there's rain in the ground, he's one on soft at first, he one he's made on heavy. Yeah. Modern news, no soft ground form whatsoever. I could see this horse being really, really well backed. Yeah, so you take on Godolphin and these shorties at your peril at the moment because they are such a reliable firm, but we're all quite keen on this one. Absolutely, the price right. is wrong. Yeah, all right, so Muta Sarbeck. Uh, three on the panel for Charlie Hills' uh, Shabwell Warrior. I'd love Jim Crowley on a recovery mission. Let's go to the 345, shall we? It is the Epsom Dash. I laugh, back because this is, if you've ever been to the Dash, which I know you have, it's blinking, you miss it stuff. Oh, yeah, it takes, as they say, it takes a minute to win it. And um, anything goes in this race. I mean, you, you tend to think, oh, it used to be I wanted to be drawn on that golden highway to strip up the rails uh, on the stand side. So that would be a high number. OK, well, that sounds a good theory. Desert Law won from Stall 1 2015. Caspian Prince won from 1 in 17. And Ornate won from 2 in 2019. Anything goes in this race. you just got to be quick and you got to be lucky. And... Um, you know, the stats will tell you a load of things. It tells you that three-year-olds don't have a good record in this race. But I do like live in the dream of Adam West, who's trained probably just uh, round the corner from Epsom uh, race course. And there's a very pacey horse. He won at Sandown uh, back in April when we sponsored the race there. And then he ran at Chester. And I think Connections were worried about the soft ground there. But he came through and he won that easy enough. He's drawn 17. He's very quick. Uh, Sean Curran claiming threes on him. He was aboard him on Sandown. You know, you probably want half a dozen cracks at this, but he's a fast progressing horse. And at Sandown, connections were quick to say the dash is his main uh, target. So here we are. And he's got a decent draw for me. You're right, Pat. Pacey horses from that wider stall. So low numbers on the outside, Golden Highway, they're the high numbers for you. They always usually end up on the stand side in this race. Mm. Honestly, when you're down at the start, if you're there at Epsom, you're in for a right treat, literally a minute to win it. And... You've got to have a lot of pace there. There's loads of pace with just a, um, another bottle in stall one. So if you're drawn low, don't worry about it. Are you going to have a couple of arrows in this? I'm going to stick with one arrow. I don't really like betting on these kind of races because I always think with sprints, like you just you run, them, you run them 100 times and 100 different results. Can but be. From a handicapping perspective, I thought Stone of Destiny was quite interesting. Um, he's, what, £10 lower than he was when third last season yeah. and he, he's going to get a strong pace to aim at. He kind of gets a bit further than five. But uh, last season, yeah, he, he was he was last about furlong out. It was a tough watch for everyone in the race yeah. last year with him. I was on him as well. Yeah. I, I'm going to pass him over. I think Pat might be right. Adam West has got an, another horse in there called Live in the Moment as well, who the hitman heart, Jason, takes the ride on. But interestingly, Sylvester D'Souza was jocked up for him until the greatest showman got into the race. And if you go back to when the Blue Ribbon trial... Uh, was run that day. They also have that opening five furlong race, always a leading pointer to this. The Greatest Showman did extremely well to finish second. Uh, Mocketeel, <coughs> of course, last year's winner of this race. He's the only course winner in the race, would you believe it, out of all that big, strong field. Uh, I think he'll reverse the form with him, and he will do for Amy Murphy, who's absolutely flying. Stall 15, just needs a bit of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah, all right. Let's move on to a race where you'll be hoping luck doesn't come into it and the cream rises to the top. Big field, Pat Cooney. It is the Kazoo Epsom Derby, running the memory of Lester Piggott. Who wins, man? Um, I just think, as they say, kiss, keep it simple. The Dante winner, Desert Crown. I mean, what's not to love? You don't even have to worry about soft ground for him because it was soft when he won his maiden at Nottingham. He was hugely impressive in the Dante. Horses that have been beaten in the Dante have come on and won at Epsom. And I'm just very much taken by any time Sir Michael Stout is interviewed. He seems to be interviewed quite a bit at the moment. And the horses are going well. He's having winners around the country. Um, you just get the feeling that this horse really is the real deal. And he's going to be tough to beat for me. I, I look at the Aidan O'Brien runners, Stone Age, etc. Again, I wouldn't say there's much between them all. Stone Age would probably be one that would like to go forward in the race as well. It's a big field. You're going to have to have uh, luck in running, of course, which maybe that's a surprise that we get to the number of runners that we have. But Desert Crown, he's inexperienced. That may count against him, of course. But if you're saying to me who's the best horse in the race, I have no doubt it's Desert Crown. <sighs> yes. Hmm. I'm the same. I think he's the best horse in the race. But I just can't, I can't help but be concerned he's only run twice. If he had another win to his name, 
I think I'd prefer him. When we had William Haggis on a couple of weeks ago, we asked him about what he thought about the derby because he's, you know, he had, a, you know, he was winning some trials and all that sort of stuff. And what did you make of the Dante? And he said, he, he kind of told us that if he's got the know-how to get around Epsom, he'll win. Yeah, I, you'd have to. The you'd vibes have to in agree. Newmarket. Are I mean, a race post rate of one twenty on your second start. I can't remember. Has that ever doesn't been done? Doesn't really happen, like, does it? No, that's absolutely crazy. Royal Patronage has another go at him. Royal Patronage has had a run in the Guineas. He travelled like a beaut through the race, didn't he? Really easy to battle. Yeah. I was there that day on Dandy Day. Uh, and he does look a picture. up. The stamina, and this is the pedigree puzzle, Robbie, isn't it? You know, yeah. every, you know, all our bloodstock supremas go for it. Kitty Trice, who's in the office with us today, mm. she's done the piece about the bloodstock. She's gone for changing the guard because she thinks he'll stay, stay, stay. He will stay, yeah. Stone Age, 118, when he won the Derby trial at Leopardstown. Really like him. Yep. Very unconventional profile for a Derby winner. He's not far off him, but if, if he gets the ride from the stall that we think he's going to, from, from Ryan Moore. There'll be lots of pace on, won't there? Stone Age yeah, will be, from stall four, he's going to want to go on. He's going to take out of lot of beat, isn't he? Ah, uh, well, Stone, yeah, I think he'll run well, yeah. Um, I think now he's drifted to kind of more suitable price. At one point, he was kind of like five to two sort of thing. And uh, then uh, Desert so, Crown came out, of course. Yeah, exactly. Uh, even, even after that, he, he, he's, he's been quite short. I, I feel like he has drifted lately. But, um, I mean, I've been changing my mind with Desert Crown quite a lot. I think he's the best horse in the race. I think he could be an absolute superstar. It's the price that worries but you for a the, horse of the It's the price, the yeah. inexperience, yeah. and the lack of, yeah, the so lack of what, So Michael Stout came out and said, wasn't it? He doesn't really need to improve from the Dante. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a quite a ludicrous quote. He got an quote. outside run. That's a mad thing to say, isn't it? It's quite a ludicrous <laughs> quote, yeah. I mean, I've, I've just stuck with uh, Sonny Liston at a monster price. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the ground now, but I just thought that, in that chest, in that D stakes behind Star of India, I thought he shaped best in that race. Yet Star of India was about kind of 12 to 1, and Sonny Liston was like 66 to 1 at one point. Um, I mean, the prices are kind of correct themselves a little bit to, to a certain extent. But it, just at Chester, yeah, I mean, he was, he just, he was free wide around the home turn. He had too much to do. He finished best. Um, Will you with, be back in a horse like that in the extra place market and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I've done a win only on the exchange, but uh, yeah, so that would be the way I was looking. I mean, 17, you'd be hopeful to get five places somewhere. So. His for deal? Uh, yeah, like him. Uh, no form on soft, which is a concern. Is it going to be but, soft? I mean, it's baking out there at the moment on, on yeah, Thursday. That, that's, that's just the issue. We don't really know until near the time. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't put anyone off. I mean, the form of that Bally Sachs win looks uh, pretty, pretty strong. Um, I'm going to go sunny list in each way, but uh, I think Desert Crown will probably win. It's just the, the price. All right. I think a lot of people will be echoing that out there. It is 4.30. It is the 2022 Derby. Good luck wherever you're going. For me, I hope we see a fav. That's a superstar. Time for those all-important weekend winners. I've got a bitter taste after, oh, this is us last Saturday. He runs, of course, on the card. It's just a bad draw for him, but I think he will give you another run for your money if you're going back in. Recouping losses, 2.35 in the Princess Elizabeth Stakes with Bashkarova for the aforementioned Haggis and Marquand team. Massive run when they expected it to just need it at Goodwood last time. That's often been a precursor for this. I think she's one of the strongest favourites of the entire weekend. I would have been going for the following race. Yeah, you've uh, I've stolen your thunder a bit there, you haven't have. I? Walked into steamed into the studio, so I've got got on a really like, and I, and I said, "Is it Mutsarbek?" And you were like, "Yeah." And at being the pro that I am, I found another I've, one for I've us. Found another but one. yeah, Mutsarbek for me, for the reasons outlined, uh, I just don't understand the difference in price between him and Modern News. There's nothing really in it on form, and so if there's three points difference in the market, then you go for the bigger one. Don't you? Do you know what? This is that's a strong start for the naps. Let's see what the Stoke Empire has to say about the treble. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm off to Doncaster, the 341. Uh, it's a big day for Sir Michael Stout. He's got Desert Crown, of course, in the Derby an hour later. But he runs a horse called Migdam, uh, number three on the card. Won his last two races, both on the all-weather, over a shorter trip. And it's one of those things, isn't it? You just say, oh, he's a typical Sir Michael Stout improver. Well, this one surely is. And he starts off his three-year-old career over 10 furlongs. Off a mark of just 89. I bet in a couple of months' time, you look at Migdam, see what his official rating is. I bet it's not 89. I bet it's a lot more. So, yeah, this first run of the year, but the stable are going well. It's a big day for Sir Michael. It'll be even bigger if this fellow wins the race before. We were all about to pelt him with some pearlers, <laughs> weren't we? But uh, he's made a convincing case there. I'm, I'm very happy with the naps this week. <laughs> there are your weekend winners. Three strong'uns. Well, sadly, that 
is all we've got time for on this weekend's What a Shout. Thanks to Willie Muir for coming on and giving us the insight. Really good to chat to him. Thanks to Wilders. Thanks for having me, mate. It's been uh, a pleasure. Listen, it's always a pleasure. I mean, it's you're, good fun, you're, that. You know, you're a crazy cat, but people are getting you out there. Um, mm. Desert Crown, you're expecting to probably take the win. Where were you watching? Yeah. That's one thing. Uh, like good question. I've got, uh, got a do lined up on... Saturday night. There's a lot of do's going on this weekend. Yeah, it's just, I don't think well, it'll be much about the Queen. No offence uh, to Her Majesty, but uh, yeah, somewhere in... Where does the fella live? Sort of like West London. So you'll be watching it in the park? Like, nah, around his flat and then we'll go after, I reckon. Will everyone watch it? Will everyone like uh, none of my it? None of my mates who have got... I've only got two mates who like racing, they're not around. That's what I'm so saying. That's the I'll be thing. watching it on the telly probably and no one will give a monkeys. Get them into it, Wilders, for yeah. goodness sake. <laughs> Pat, now of course we know it's all about Perth on Sunday. You'll be packing your bags on Saturday. But no doubt the Cooney family will be perched in front of the television come 4.30. Yeah, uh, you know when it's Grand National Day and to a lesser extent, you know, when it's Derby Day because people that you haven't spoken to for a year ring you up and say, what do you fancy in the Derby? What should I have a fiver each way on? So, uh, yeah, it's it's still got its uh, uh, mystique in the in the betting public and it is a second biggest turnover race of the year and that's going to be proven again this time around. I hope whatever wins it goes on to be a real superstar. Absolutely. I think the middle distance ranks could certainly do with a few this year, couldn't they? Good luck to you then, whatever you're playing in the derby out there. Thanks for watching this week's What A Shout. Don't forget Gamble Responsibly. That's our MO here at Bet365 and, of course, the Racing Post. Don't forget to download the free Must Have Racing Post app. You can do that on the App Store or the Google Play Store. Loads of sport out there this weekend, but it's all about the derby. Enjoy it.